I want to read for you a passage of scripture from John from John chapter 19 and we're going to read verses 17 to 22 and 28 to 34 and it tells just a part of the Good Friday story but let me read it for you. Carrying his own cross he went up to the place of the skull which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with two others one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Verse 28, later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had reached the drink, Jesus, sorry, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation and the next day was to be a special Sabbath because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Last week on Palm Sunday, I didn't really preach a sermon. Instead, we looked at the events that were leading up to and including the triumphal entry from two sets of eyes, Lazarus, the man whom Jesus had raised from the dead, and Jesus himself. I'd like to do something similar today with the events of the day of Jesus' crucifixion. Only this time, I want to look through Mary's eyes, the mother of Jesus, and Jesus himself. I certainly want it to be biblically based, but I admit that some of this is me trying to put my head and my heart into what Jesus and Mary would have been thinking and feeling and doing in the moment. My imaginations don't change the meaning of the story any but please be sure to separate fact from my speculation. It all happened so very fast. Preparations were being made for the Passover just like any other year, and suddenly Mary's oldest son, Jesus, was arrested. He had never so much as told a little white lie, let alone do anything that would warrant this kind of treatment. He always encouraged obedience to the authorities, and when it came to his religious practices, well, he did it God's way rather than man's way. And you can't fault him for that, but it sure upset some of the religious leaders. It was early. The morning after Jesus' arrest, it was probably about 7 a.m., and Mary was standing among a significant crowd of Jews, and she watched anxiously certain of her son's acquittal. And finally, after what seemed like an eternity, the Roman governor, Pilate, comes and stands on the balcony. Mary can't believe her ears when he shouts to the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it's your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? Even more dumbfounding was the response of the crowd. They shouted back to Pilate, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. Mary couldn't believe what, she, what was happening. Pilate ordered that Jesus be scourged and flogged, possibly hoping that if Jesus survived it, it would appease the crowd without killing an innocent man. Her son was pushed and shoved like a rag doll into the praetorium. He was surrounded by Roman soldiers, laughing and jeering at the humble man who claimed to be the king of the Jews. And he was stripped and bent over, and his hands were tied to a post. And then 39 times 
Mary heard the cries of her son. As the cat of nine tails, pieces of bone and iron and glass attached to strips of leather at the end of a whip ripped through his flesh. She couldn't watch. Could you? I imagine her burying her head in her hands until the screaming stopped and then cautiously looking up, seeing her son leaning limp against the pose, his back laid wide open. She wanted so badly to caress him. In an act of absolute mockery of his claim to be king of the Jews, the soldiers took him away from the crowd. And they draped a purple robe over his raw flesh. And they twisted together a crown uh, made of thorns that was pressed into his skull. And his head was now swollen and blood trickled down his face to now rest, match the rest of his body. And they put a staff in his hand. And they knelt before him repeated lo- re- repeatedly shouting, Hail, King of the Jews! And then they spat on him. And they beat him in the head with the staff over and over again. When Mary and the others saw him again, he was wearing the purple robe and the crown of thorns. His face was bloody and swollen, making it obvious that he had been abused while in the governor's courts. And Pilate said to them, here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. One more time, Pilate tried to save Jesus' life, but again came the shouts, crucify him. It seemed like an eternity had passed, but it was only about 8 a.m. when the soldiers started to make their way through the city and the streets were starting to be lined with people and Mary knew that this had to be about Jesus. And so she quickly made her way through some of the back streets and getting ahead of the slow moving procession to where she could see clearly. And sure enough, there was her son, now with his own clothes on, sopped in blood, carrying a wooden cross that was resting on his bloody and swollen shoulder, staggering his way up the street, barely conscious. She wanted to get to him so bad, but the soldiers wouldn't allow it. Realizing that they were never going to make their destination destination at this rate, the soldiers commanded the assistance of a man in the crowd to carry the cross. Mary felt bad for the man named Simon, but was so happy for the relief that her son was getting. Another hour had gone by when they finally reached the top of the hill. It was what the Jews referred to as the third hour, 9 a.m. They were at a place called Golgotha, or the place of the skull. It was a common location for Rome's execution of the worst criminals in Israel, and they did it by crucifixion. There were two others that day. Mary was helpless as Simon, exhausted, laid the cross on the ground. The Roman soldiers pushed Jesus onto his back and then drug his body onto the cross. They put his feet together on the upright post and his arms on the cross member and one of the soldiers took a mallet and a spike and drove the spike through his hand and then the other hand and then his feet. More screams of agony came from her dying son. How much more could his body take? How much more could a mother's heart take? They positioned the bottom of the cross where a hole had been dug and then from behind they lift it until the cross suddenly drops into the hole. This time his weight bears down on the nails and the scream seems to echo echo over the valley. Now the cross stands upright and her son, looking over the city of Jerusalem and at the temple, the place of sacrifice and worship, the place he loves so very much. And suddenly Mary's mind flashes back to 33 years earlier when the angel said, 
you will conceive and give birth to a son. And you will call him Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And her response was, how will this be since I am a virgin? And she found herself asking the question once again. She had no doubt about the moment that Jesus' birth was announced to her. It was as vivid in her mind that day as the day the angel appeared to her. Plus, it's pretty hard to forget or misunderstand an immaculate conception. Her son, conceived of the Holy Spirit, would be the king of Israel for all eternity. But the same question floods her mind as she looks at Jesus on the cross. How will this be? It seemed pretty much certain that either the greatest miracle ever done by Jesus was about to happen, or he was going to die, and soon. She watched life slowly fading from his body, occasionally opening opening his eyes and scanning the small group of people that gathered on the mountain. Mary would do anything to make eye contact with him, to tell him with her eyes how sorry she was and that she loved him. And some time goes by, and so typical of her son, he says with all the strength that he can muster, as he looks down at the people around him, the ones, same ones that are mocking him and are responsible for his death that day, he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Mary's heart melted inside when she heard those words because that had to be the heart of the Son of God. Who else could pray a prayer like that in a moment like this after all they had done to him? But the crowd begins to mock him, as do the soldiers, and some even cast lots for his clothes. It's it's about 11 a.m. now. And the criminal on one side of him joins the soldiers and the mockers, making fun of Jesus' claims. But the other criminal believes in who Jesus said he was and asked to be remembered by Jesus. And Mary knew that if it was for that one soul alone, her son would have died so that he could have eternal life. That would be true for you as well. Jesus would have died for you if you were the only person on earth that would receive him. Then the most touching thing happens. Jesus finally sees Mary. That's what she wanted so badly, is what she needed. Volumes could be written about what they said to each other with their eyes in that moment. And then he sees his disciple, John, nearby. And the scripture says when Jesus saw his mother there and The disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. So close to death, he needed to know that his mother would be properly cared for. I can only imagine that such an expression of love for Mary was an incredibly emotional moment for her. And then at noon, a heavy darkness fell over the earth. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The weight of the sin of all mankind is beginning to rest on the Savior's shoulders, and he's feeling things that he's never felt before, and so was Mary. She's heartbroken. She's confused. She's angry with her religious leader. She's hurt. She's disillusioned. She's fearful, and above all, she's devastated by the events of the day. Jesus moans out, I'm thirsty. And after he had a drink, Jesus Luke records this, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. And John says when when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, 
He bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. And there stood Mary, stunned. Jesus' life flashing before her eyes. Her mind must have been trying to process everything the angel told her at conception, remembering him as a child, running around as a toddler, and as he grew, helping his dad in the carpenter's shop, and his first miracle, turning water into wine at the wedding of a family friend. The amazing events of Jesus' life, the lessons that he taught, the private conversations, it must have all been in the blender of her thoughts at that moment, trying to make sense of it all all the while emotionally broken by observing the horrible death of her son. Sometimes our human mind wants to make sense of things, especially when we're experiencing emotional upheaval. We assume that understanding will somehow bring comfort, and sometimes it does. But sometimes only hindsight will reveal what we need to know. Sometimes you have to wait to see what you can't see now. The answers were in the scripture and in Jesus' teachings, but, but re reality caused so much confusion. But the confusion was temporary. But Sunday was coming, and everything would be made clear. Even in today's situation, folks, the answers that you're looking for, they might be found partly in Scripture and they may be made clear through future events, but your peace should come in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So there stood Mary. You can imagine being her for just a moment, can you? And as she stands there in the dark at noon, the earth begins to shake. And what she can't see is that the temple veil in Jerusalem is torn in two from top to bottom, an event that's rich with symbolism. And the centurion, the soldier that was responsible for what took place on the hill that day, he said, surely he was the son of God. And as the day comes to an end, one of the soldiers did as they were asked to do, and he breaks the legs of the criminals to make sure that they can't escape if they aren't yet dead. But with Jesus, he pierced his side with a spear, spilling his blood to the ground. The crowd had dissipated. The soldiers wanted to get home to their families, and there stands Mary, gazing at her dead son. What on earth just happened? How could this possibly be? There's no doubt that Jesus knew he was going to die and that today was the day. How much detail he knew about what was going to happen, we don't really know, but, but he understood the prophecies about that day in a way probably that no one else did. Being betrayed by Judas was not a surprise. His, his arrest the night before was not a surprise. Peter denying knowing him was not a surprise. That knowledge didn't make make anything one bit easier. He still felt the pain of betrayal. He still felt the sting of one of his closest friends denying him or denying knowing him. And now he stood in a palace, not because he was given his rightful place as king, but because he was questioned, being questioned as a criminal. He had been arrested the night before, and I, I question whether he had any sleep at all when he stood before Pilate early in the morning. The Jewish high priest had brought him there. And his offense? Accepting worship as king of the Jews. And Jesus' response to Pilate was simple and true. He said, Pilate said, what, what is it that you have done? And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Pilate knew that Jesus wasn't guilty of a crime. He certainly hadn't broken any Roman laws. The only thing that he was guilty of was making the Jewish religious leaders angry. But the last thing Pilate wanted was an uprising of the Jews. It would bring his abilities to handle the position of governor in, in Israel into question. And Pilate thought he had the perfect 
solution for setting Jesus free. Every year at the Jewish Passover, he freed one prisoner. It was a Jewish custom. And so he steps out onto the balcony of his place and he offers the crowd Jesus or Barabbas, a known criminal. Surely they would choose to free Jesus. But the crowd had been stirred up by their religious leaders. And it wasn't that hard. I mean, they were already disillusioned. It was obvious that Jesus wasn't going to live up to their misled expectations when he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey just five days earlier. He wasn't going to present himself to be the king of Israel. Not the way they anticipated. It was no surprise to Jesus when he heard them respond, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Then came the call to crucify him. This would be the time for him to call down angels from heaven if he was going to, or beam me up, Father. But instead, he willingly submitted to the will and the hands of those who would beat him and mock him and eventually kill him. The Apostle Paul wrote about it this way. He said, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. In this moment, Jesus chose to complete the task of being the sacrificial lamb that he came to be, the Passover lamb, the sacrifice sufficient for once and for all. The writer of Hebrews wrote in chapter 7, 27, unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. From this moment, his life became a blur of pain and mockery and abuse. He was pushed and shoved and dragged into the praetorium. He was bent over and untied to a po or tied to a post. And when that first blow of the cat of nine tails hit his back, pain ripped through his body like he had been struck by lightning. And then it happened again and again, 39 times. And by the end, the flesh on his back was literally ripped open and blood was dripping off his body. And he felt pain and numbness at the same time. He didn't even have the strength to stand. He was collapsed against the post. And all he could think of was the prophetic words of Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. That says, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, or the King James Version, by his stripes, we are healed. And this feeling of accomplishment seemed to strengthen his resolve. He knew that what he was doing was the perfect will of the Heavenly Father. He never wanted to wear man's kingly robes that was forced on him. The soldiers put a purple robe on his open flesh and they twisted together a crown of thorns and they pressed it into his head. His kingdom, even though in heaven and on earth, was never intended to be the kind that men typically thought of. And as the Roman soldiers beat him and spat on him, another scripture gave him strength. Isaiah 56, I, I offered my back to those who beat me my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Physically weak, yet strengthened by the knowledge that he was doing exactly what he came to earth to do, the will of the Father, and that the plan was being carried out now in rapid fashion. Pilate brought him out to the balcony. He didn't even look like the same Jesus that he did moments earlier. He was bloody and swollen and could barely stand. One more offer to set him free was given to the crowd, but the shouts of the people, many of them the same people that just five days earlier had shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Now their new shouts rang through his brain. Crucify him. Crucify him. And physically, he had taken more than many men could, could bear already, but a wooden cross was laid over his shoulder. He was expected to carry it through the city, then up the hill to the place called Golgotha. He did his best, one step, then another, very slowly, deliberately, occasionally staggering. Sheer weakness and the weight of the cross was almost more than he could bear. He thought he heard his mother's voice calling out to him. Oh, how he wished to have his mother's comforting arms around him. But in the seconds that he could steal before being yelled at and possibly struck by the Roman soldier, he couldn't find her in the crowd. Still, there was comfort in knowing she was there. He couldn't believe the relief when the soldiers handed his cross to another man. And I, I, I can just imagine Jesus trying to offer a smile to Simon and maybe even a word of thanks. Reaching the top of the hill was momentary relief. Thankfully, the walk and the trek to the top of that hill was complete, but the rest was short-lived. Quickly, he was pushed to the ground and then dragged onto his cross. Would have been excruciating laying on that board, his back raw from the flogging. He thought he had reached the pinnacle of physical pain until the nail severed a nerve as it fastened his hand to the cross, then the other, then his feet. And as the cross was being lifted, the city of Jerusalem was coming into view. Oh, how he loved that city. And it was buzzing with people there for the Passover. And then he spotted the temple, reminding him that after today, for those that understood, not another sacrifice would need to be made. And then the weight of his body pulled on the nails as the cross dropped into his hole. And yet another cry of pain seemed to echo over the valley and into the city. And there he hung. Criminals sometimes hung for days before they died, ultimately dying from dehydration or the wounds from being flogged or scourged or infection from the nails or asphyxiation as the weight of the body pressed on the heart and the lungs. Jesus, unable to hold his head up for more than a few seconds, looked down at the people on the ground and typical of him. Instead of anger, compassion filled his heart. As they continued to mock him, he knew that it was ignorance that caused them to do what they were doing. And so he prayed for them. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And he hears his mother's voice again and again. He needs to see her one more time, but he can't find her in the seconds that he has his eyes open. The mocking continues from the soldiers and the religious leaders. And it seemed like everyone who passed through his vision had some slanderous remark to make. Even the man hanging next to him was jeering him. But from the other side, he hears these words. Speaking to the criminal on yet the other side of him, he says, since, don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. If you're willing to acknowledge that Jesus truly is the Son of God, and place your faith in him as the ultimate sacrifice for your sins. His offer to you is the same as it was to the person hanging next to him that day. Eternity in paradise. And finally, Jesus spots his mom. He can see the heartbreak in her eyes, not to mention the tears streaming down her face. But somehow still, her presence is comforting. 
He tries to maintain that eye contact as long as he can, trying to stay alert, keeping his head up and communicating his love and thanksgiving to her with his eyes. And then he notices John, his disciple, not too far away. And in his own words, he says, John, I'd like you to take, I'd like, I'd like you to make sure my mom is looked after. And mom, if you need anything, you can count on John. And as the day moves on, a different look comes over Jesus. And Matthew 27 says, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Theologians have been trying to understand the theology behind this statement for centuries, and some would say that Jesus was feeling separation from the Father, which is a description of real death, and he was feeling this because of the sins of the world that he was taking on himself. It was part of being our substitute, although he had never sinned. He was feeling the pain of separation from God as part of the price that he had to pay. And whether that is right or whether it was something else, I don't know, but in the moment, it is what Jesus felt, or he wouldn't have said it. He felt alone. He felt like he had the weight of the world on his shoulders. And he felt separated from his father. Perhaps the pain we see in this comment is the worst pain that Jesus had experienced all day. It wasn't physical. It seemed like it was spiritual and it was emotional. And he's thirsty too. They've filled a sponge with white vinegar and offered it to him. And I, I don't know about you, but to me that doesn't sound very thirst quenching. Sounds more like torture to me. And then Jesus spoke his final words. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And Matthew 27, 50, 51 says, when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split. When Jesus cried out with a loud voice, it is finished, and the temple veil was torn from top to bottom, understand that those were the most powerful words ever spoken and the most significant event ever happened in the history of mankind. Jesus had finished what he was set out to do. The will of the Father was complete. He had become the perfect sacrifice for every person who believed before and all who would come after. He was the perfect sacrificial Lamb of God who had completed his task here on earth. And as a result, that which separated man from God, symbolized by the temple veil, was removed torn from top to bottom. And for the first time since the Garden of Eden, men and women would have free access to the presence of the Almighty God simply by facing the, placing their faith in what Jesus Christ did for us at Calvary. All hope for eternal life was wrapped up in this moment of time. Hebrews 10, 19 to 23 says, Therefore, brothers, and sister, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. On the cross, we saw Jesus offer of forgiveness to those who mocked him and killed him. We saw the offer of eternal life to those who placed their faith in him, even, even a criminal. On the cross, we saw compassion for his mother representing those in need and the commissioning of those who had the resources to help, like John. 
On the cross, we saw an unwavering commitment to finish what he came to earth to do, no matter the cost, no matter the pain. And on the cross, we saw the completion of a plan that gave man direct access into the presence of God. On the cross, we saw an example of how to serve God until his will is finished. For the past 33 years, those who were privileged enough to see Jesus saw God personified. They saw the true nature of God in human form in his combined nature. They saw the Son of God and the Son of Man. But now it was finished. And on this Good Friday, the word of John the Baptist rang out again to all who heard it. Behold the Lamb of God the last lamb that ever needed to be sacrificed as an atonement for sin had been sacrificed. It was finished. So I want to end by asking you, what do you need from God today? Do you need compassion? Do you need to be commissioned? Do you need access into God's presence to pray and to ask him for some need in your life or in the need of a, love, of a loved one? Do you need forgiveness? Do you need a sacrificial lamb? Do you need a savior? Do you need the hope of eternal life in heaven? Through tr tremendous pain and anguish, physically, emotionally and spiritually. Jesus made all of that available to you. It's a free gift. He's paid the price. You just have to receive it. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today once again reminded of the price that you and your son, Jesus Christ, paid for us. You paid it for your salvation, absolutely, but also so that we, you paid it for our salvation, but also so that we could have free access to that, uh, to all that emanates from your presence, your peace, your joy, your love, your grace, your kindness, your goodness, your mercy. Father, there may be people listening today, especially with the world's circumstances as they are right now, that need to access your presence. Some don't have the assurance of where they would go if they got the COVID-19 virus and passed away. Some are living in fear for themselves or their families. Some are uncertain about their future, whether it be financial or in any other way. So many emotions are so vivid right now. And I pray that today, everyone in my listening ears would accept the finished work of Jesus Christ as being done for them personally so that they can receive all that you have to offer. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember when my brothers and sisters and I were children and we went to a little Sunday school, a little gospel hall in London, Ontario, one of our teachers taught us to say John 3.16 and placing our name in it. Perhaps you would like to do that today. The scripture says, For God so loved Tim Lukings, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, that if Tim Lukings believed in him, he should not perish, but have everlasting life. You could put your name into that verse. I want to thank you for watching today, and I, I hope that you'll join us again for our Easter service, 1030 Sunday morning. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.